here. And, um, and Mark's gospel is a, is a lower Christology, meaning it, it, it's, it's um, looking much more at the humanity of Jesus and into that humanity of Jesus and, and um, how he reveals his, uh, his, his uh, nature as the Messiah through that human nature. And, and whereas um, the Gospel of John it has a much higher Christology, meaning that it concentrates much more on the, on the divine nature of Jesus. And, um, and so it's, uh, he's kind of, um, the, the Jesus in John seems to uh, know everything that's gonna happen well before it happens. He's um, very aware of what everybody else is thinking and, and motives for other people doing things. And he's much, very much aware that, that he's, um, of what's gonna happen to him when he goes to Jerusalem. And it's in his, um, his passion and his, his uh, suffering is more about his glorification rather than uh, a path of suffering. Uh, whereas Mark identifies Jesus through his passion with the suffering servant of Isaiah. Uh, John is more identifying him to, uh, to, to his pre-existent condition as God as we're told right from the start, John says, in the beginning, the word was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God, and he's talking about Jesus there, of course, and, and um, he identifies him as divine from the start, and um, where Mark never actually makes that full uh, connection to divinity in, in his gospel, but certainly in his faith he was. Um, so this week, I thought we, we would begin by uh, reading through the two uh, stories of the triumphal entry into Jerusalem from Mark and from John. So um, you have those, uh, Michelle. We're going to put them on the screen, or put one of them on the screen, or both of them on the screen. And uh, who would like to read the uh, Mark's entry into Jerusalem, or Jesus? Okay, I will. Oh, well, I'll do it. Okay, sorry. Okay, uh, Mark's 11, chapter 11, verse 1 through 10. The entry into Jerusalem. When they drew near to Jerusalem, to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately on entering it, you will find the cold tethered on which no one has ever sat, untie it and bring it here. If anyone should say to you, why are you doing this? Reply, the master has need of it and will send it back here at once. So they went off and found a colt tethered to at a gate outside on the street and they untied it. Some of the bystanders said to them, what are you doing untying the colt? They answered them just as Jesus had told them to and they permitted them to do it. So they brought the colt to Jesus and put their cloaks over, the, over it, and he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut from the fields. They preceded him as well as those following, kept crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who can, comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the kingdom of our father, David, that is to come. Hosanna in the highest. He entered Jerusalem and went into the temple area. He looked around at everything and since it was already late, went out to Bethany with the 12. Okay. And now who would like to read the, uh, the account from John? I, I will. Okay. Right. Um, right. This is the entry into Jerusalem. On the next day, when the great crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, they took palm branches and went out to meet him and cried out, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. 
um, I don't, I can't read any more. Oh, can I do it? No. No. Nope. I'm not getting. I'm not getting any more. You have the. You have this. No, book? I can't. You don't have this book. Oh, I. Oh, I do. I'm actually. Yeah. Okay. Even. Um, you can you? Jesus found an ass and sat upon it. As is written, fear no more, O daughter Zion. See, your king comes seated upon an ass's colt. His disciples did not understand this at first, but when Jesus had been glorified, they remembered that these things were written about him and that they had done this to him. For him. For him. For him. Okay. All right. What was so, oh. I mean, just, the, just in that cursory thing, I think we can look and see that there are a few things that, that are definitely, um, there are some similarities, of course. One is that uh, in both both uh, readings, he rides in on the colt or or an ass, and, and an ass's colt, they were told. And um, and so that okay. this uh, for a king to enter a city, usually you don't enter on an ass on a donkey. You enter you enter on a horse, or you enter on a um, on a in a chariot, or in some kind of um, majestical setting you know you don't you don't come in on something like a donkey now this is but this particular reference is a reference to for for both of these writers uh it's a reference to um what uh um, zechariah speaks of in his in the second sec, second half of zechariah he talks about a humble king making an entrance into the city and this is the Messiah that Zechariah is speaking of. And uh, it's a very much a messianic passage. And, and for first century Jews, that would have been, they would have recognized that, that um, sign of Jesus sitting on a hum, on, humbly on an ass and being, uh, being hailed as a king. And this was, as I said, it was, it was a sign of the Messiah. So both, again, are, are connecting him to, to that messianic uh, ministry of of jesus that messianic nature of jesus um also uh the what they say it's pretty similar hosanna blessed is he who comes in the name of the lord the king of israel and in mark it's um where is it in mark it's hosanna blessed is he who comes in the name of the lord blessed is the kingdom of our father david that is to come hosanna in the highest <clears throat> and again, for Mark, <clears throat> uh, I mean that they're, they're very similar to one another in reference to um, uh, statements uh, of, in the uh, prophets again about about the Messiah and and, and how how we would enter the city of Jerusalem and and what would be said of him. <clears throat> and um, so, so these these similarities again point to. A same, uh, that they're writing about the same person, you know, they both have the same idea, even though they come at it from very different uh, angles, you might say. Mark, like, again, coming from that that human side and, and, um, and John coming from that divine side. Now, Mark's entrance into the city um, tells us a little bit, gives a little sense of uh, of the um, where where he talks about how where is it at I'm looking at uh, I'm sorry let me look at John let me look at John he he speaks about it and he says that um, where is it when the great crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming they took palm branches that none of the other gospels mentioned palm branches now. Palm branches were used at, at another feast of Judaism, the feast of the tabernacle of uh, the booths, they call it. Now, what it is, I believe what this feast is, is, a, is um, a feast where they remember their time in the desert. The Jews uh, recall being in the desert, they, they build a, a, like a, 
even unto this day, some Jews will build in their yard a tent or a um, a house with, uh, a, I mean, a, a, a shanty like with covered by branches. And um, they don't use palm branches up here because there's not too many palm trees around. But in other places, they would use palm branches. In Jerusalem, they would use palm branches to cover the cover those those tents, those uh, temporary dwelling places. And again, it was a it was a it's a, a feast that they celebrate their time in the desert. So again, this is John connecting Jesus to the uh, the events of the Exodus of of Passover, and um, and John uses a lot of imagery of, of Passover um, in his uh, in his passion account too whereas um and mark does too but but he, he's he's more um john's more of an artist i think than than mark was he's uh he's more refined i i would bet he was more educated than mark was too and um in his writing he you see it in the in his um subtlety in his writing so he's again pointing out using imagery that that first century jews would have would recognize and he's uh pointing out to them the connection between jesus and the passover between jesus and the desert the, the time in the exodus and um and and so mark um again in, in all the other three gospels they don't they don't mention palm branches they just mention branches being put on the ground as as a way to signify jesus um uh, royal nature that is entering the city as a king and where mark is i mean john is making that point but he's also emphasizing he's entering it as, as the messianic king uh it's much more a a connection for mark i mean for john than than for mark is uh in this in liter literarily speaking um now the the, some of the other little aspects of it, like the story about why, you know, going into the village opposite and immediately upon entering it, why he told that story, we, we don't know. It has, the, it has the taste of an eyewitness account, you know, where, so you, you get little hints at, at different points in the gospels of that somebody who saw these things initially was telling these stories and it may they may not they didn't record them but someone who heard those stories recorded those stories and then as as things happen as they recorded those stories um layers were added to it um each time that the story was told originally by orally and then uh, was transmitted by writing it and even even in the writing of it, they probably didn't. It wasn't in a in the form of a gospel, like Mark, Matthew, Luke, or John, until um, well, Mark is the first one around seventy, you know, eight around seventy A.D. So seventy years after Jesus was alive, and um, it wasn't written in that form for for a long time. So some of these stories may have been written down and and gathered as collections of stories about Jesus, but not organized to tell his life, just to tell, if you needed a story about Jesus, here was a collection of stories of Jesus. It's like the short stories of uh, O. Henry, you know, they're, they're different stories, not connected to one another, except they're the same story. I mean, they're written by the same author. And, um, and these are, these stories of Jesus were not connected to one another as, as a history, not connected to one another as a, um, as any uh, progression or anything like that. Just as the person remembered them, they're written down and put in a collection. And, and so they're, they're not organized at all in that, in that story. And Mark, Matthew, Luke, and John probably take those stories and then they, organize them as they uh, see fit. Um, and so 
like I said, that that is a little clue about maybe there's an eyewitness behind all this too. And uh, so again, the the uh, this begins the whole passion narrative, so so to speak. Uh, I mean, it, it doesn't in the it begins the, the passion narrative in the Gospel of Mark, and um, from from there we when we do the gospel when we do the gospel reading at mass it begins right after the entry into jerusalem with the story of the anointing um and and so it that's where the passion narrative for mark begins in on palm sunday it begins at the um after the feast of the leaven he was in bethany reclining at the table of Simon the leper and a woman came in with the alabaster jar. So, so that moves from, well, but in between that though, is, this, is another story that I just want to spend a little bit of time on. Well, a couple of things. First off is after Jesus goes to Bethany, after he's come into the, to the city, he goes to Bethany, right? Oh yeah. I, I, I I'm a little, uh, Join it tonight, but let me just say this both Mark and um, John tell us where Jesus is coming from. Now, remember this in the Gospel of Mark, remember we had, I mean, in the Gospel of John, we had just read the story last week and just heard the uh, account of the anointing of Jesus at Bethany in the house of Martha and Mary. And Lazarus, where he's anointed there. And then from there, we go into the triumphal entry into Jerusalem. So he's in Bethany. And in the Gospel of Mark, we're told um, how if I can find it here, it says to us. In the Gospel of Mark, when Jesus and his disciples drew near to Jerusalem to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives. Again, both in both accounts, he's coming from Bethany to enter into the city. Again, another, another symbol of where the how the Messiah is to enter the city of Jerusalem, how he is to, to come back to the city of Jerusalem. And uh, and so these these little little signs are pointing to who Jesus is. And as I said, a first century Jew would have understood these signs almost innately. Um, for us, it's not as easy to understand. So so they so so then from there, okay, in the Gospel of Mark, well, in the in the Gospel of John, we go. The next story is about Jesus meeting with some Greeks. But in the Gospel of Mark, it's the cursing of the fig tree. Now, this is where these two separate a lot. Because you figure the cursing of the fig tree in Mark is, is a story about how Jesus is hungry. After the entering the city, and he's, he's walking along, going to Bethany and from Jerusalem, and he's uh, and he's hungry, and he goes to a fig tree to get something to eat, and there's no fruit on the fig tree. So, what does he do? He curses the fig tree so that it'll never bear fruit again. And and the reason he does that, you know, symbolically is because he's uh, saying that it's kind of like that that saying where he says that the uh, bridegroom is here. And there's no reason to fast while the bridegroom is here. You fast when the bridegroom goes. And he's saying that I am the bridegroom and the, and the tree was not in fruit in season when the, when the uh, Messiah came. So that this, this tree is uh, no longer going to bear fruit. The tree is a symbol of the temple for Mark. The, and he, he talks about it. It's uh, 
He's saying that the, the old way, the, the old temple worship is no longer going to bear fruit for people. He's telling, he's telling his, his listeners that this old way of, of offering sacrifice in the temple is no longer um, in season, you might say. And so um, a lot of what Mark talks about from now through much of the, um, up until the Last Supper is about the temple. He's addressing the temple and, and Jewish worship and the Jewish faith in many ways. And he said, so then the next thing that Jesus does after cursing the fig tree is he cleanses the temple, of course. And uh, in the Gospel of John, he cleanses the temple too, but that's right after the wedding at Cana. It's the first thing Jesus does in his public ministry. I don't have it on there, but um, because it's, it's nowhere near the passion. It's the beginning of Jesus' ministry. He cleanses the temple because he's God. He, he's saying there's a, new te- there's a new temple here. And he's, he's speaking of himself, of course, that he is the temple and that, that um, we must now uh, worship this new, new temple in this new temple and and then but in these gospels in, in matthew mark and luke in the synoptics he cleanses the temple right before he um uh goes to the for the last supper and everything or right as he after he enters the city of jerusalem and and so he has um again by doing that he's saying that there's something rotten about the temple worship there's something uh not right and and um and mark is making a point to his his listeners and his and his um his community that true worship is not just uh offering sacrifice and expecting it to everything to work out you know because you offered the right sacrifice said the right words but true worship is more about the uh, love in your heart. It's about the service you you uh, are willing to to give and and what you give. So many of the stories, as we look through them, the next several stories are about that true worship. Mark wants to talk about, and he's addressing that in particular over these uh, next uh, couple of pages uh, in his in his writing, as he curses the fig tree, cleanses the temple. Um, and then, uh, then he, this also begins this animosity between Jesus and the, the chief priests, the, the leaders of the false worship that's going on there. The chief priests, the temple, uh, the Pharisees and the temple guards and so forth. And how they now begin to, they're questioning Jesus and, um, and not, not so they, because they're curious, but because they're trying to trip him up. Okay, so when Jesus' authority is questioned, um, they're saying, by what authority do you do this? And Jesus, of course, being um, being the son of man, being someone who knows what true worship is, he doesn't answer that question directly. Instead, what does he do? He says, if you tell me, if you answer a question for me, I'll answer your question. Says, if you tell me where John's baptism came from, you know, by what authority he baptized, then I'll answer your question. So, and that just develops further. You know, they they get more and more um, angry with Jesus, and then the the parable of the wicked tenants. Again, what is it? It's a story about the uh, about Israel about the history of Israel, the, the salvation history of Israel, how they were um, given the, the control of the vineyard, so to speak, that the, it, and it's not, a, it's not about Israel as much as the leaders of Israel, that they were given control of the vineyard, meaning the nation of Israel, meaning that, that, that faith of Israel as the chosen people of God. And, um, so by giving given that control, then what did they do? They decided 
They wanted it to be theirs. They were going to take over that vineyard. And they they didn't they didn't do any any homage or service to the to the one owner of the vineyard, to God. And and so they when he sent his messengers, they hurt them, they beat them, and when they when he sent his son, they killed him. Figuring they would take the temp, they would take the uh, property over, and and it, and it's a again, it's a a statement, almost a, a veiled prediction of the destruction of the Jewish temple. And Mark probably, it, it's believed Mark probably was uh, a not a witness to, but knew of the destruction of the temple, which was around the year seventy A.D. That um, that it was. Uh, destroyed in Jerusalem so that he would have known about that. And so this parable he put there as a way to, to make, give Jesus some um, sense of omniscience that, uh, that he lacks in a lot of Mark's story. Um, then again, more questions to Jesus, questions to uh, trip him up. But in the middle of all this, all this animosity, all this anger, everything's going on. And then they get this um, this person asking Jesus about what is the greatest commandment, and um, it's like it's like um, you know the news sometimes they what they do is they tell us all these bad things and then they give you a little feel good story at the in the middle of it to keep you paying attention I guess you might say, and this this is kind of a little feel good story Mark gives us uh, where he tells us how this. Um, Pharisee asked Jesus what the greatest commandment is. And, and Jesus, um, I, I want to read that, that uh, account to you. If I can find it. I'm sure I can. Okay. Maybe I can. Oh. You have you have your Bible there? I have I have a couple of Bibles here. Yep. Let me look again and uh, see. Looking at Mark twelve twenty eight. Yep. Yeah. Okay. One of the scribes, when he came forward and heard them disputing and saw how well Jesus had answered them, asked them, which is the first of all the commandments? Jesus replied, this first is this, the first is this, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is Lord alone. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. The scribe said to him, well said, teacher. You are right in saying, he is the one and there is no other than he. And to love him with all your heart and with all your understanding and with all your strength and to love your neighbor as yourself is worth more than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. And when Jesus saw that, he answered with, with understand. When Jesus saw that he answered with understanding, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And no one dared to ask Jesus any more questions. Now, again, like I said, it's a feel good story because this, what the question that Jesus asked would have been, it's like a catechism answer. It's like, I don't, how many of you may have been uh, trained with the uh, Baltimore catechism, you know, and you might, it would be, an answer that would be like, who, you know, who made you? God made me. Why did God make you? To know him, to love him, and to serve him. These, these were road answers. And, and, and so this man asking Jesus that question, um, which is the greatest commandment, that would have been something that every Jew would learn. 
from a very young age because the answer that Jesus gave is the Shema, which is a, a prayer, a central prayer of Israel. Hear, O Israel, I am, I am the, uh, the Lord our God is Lord alone. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind and with all your strength. So that that would have been on on the lips of every any any believing Jew knows the, the those words, and they know that they know that that is the first and the greatest of the commandments. So that Jesus was asked it. I mean, it was a, a simple question, but um, you know, so it's it's easy to answer. It wasn't tripping him up like the other ones were and and then this um and the the man responds to him so so positively he says um you are right you know that this well said teacher you are right in saying he is the one and there is no other than he and um and so it's it's all after mark has really done a number on the jewish faith now he's saying too that there are still good Jewish believers. He's kind of saying, oh, you know, but this doesn't mean everybody. This doesn't mean the people that believe correctly. He's pointing towards the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the, the temple priests, and so forth to, you know, that they're the ones uh, that are causing this wrong worship to be, to be um, happening. And so then, then, uh, can we go back? Can we go back to the other page, Michelle? After the um, again, a question about David's son, and then Jesus denouncing the scribes, and then we have another feel-good story: the widow's offering. And in that in that story, it's. Um, Uh, let's see where it is. He sat down opposite the treasury and watched the crowd putting money into the treasury. Many rich people put in large sums. A poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which are worth a penny. Then he called his disciples and said to them, truly, I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the treasury. For all of them have contributed out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. So again, it's Mark's Messiah, Jesus, is a servant. And He's not a servant that that uh, gives out of his abundance. He's giving everything that he is and that he has. And uh, and so the widow's offering again is challenging the the temple leadership and saying this their worship is not real worship, is not true worship, but uh, because they don't give all of themselves. The widow gives all of herself. So she is um, symbolizing true worship that we give all of ourselves. And, um, and as I said last week, Mark's community was uh, quite possibly undergoing some uh, a persecution by, uh, by Nero and um, you know, could have in Rome itself. So they could have been uh, there could have been several martyrs in Mark's community already, and uh, and so he's he's trying to kind of buck them up a little bit, saying that this true worship is giving all of yourself. So he's saying, you know, those who have have been martyred, it it was an act of true worship, you might say, and um, not an act of of uh, futility, and but an act of true worship. And then again, he he as Jesus telling the, of the coming of the destruction of the temple. Um, so while all that's going on in Mark, John has a whole other storyline going on too. 
<laughs> it's uh, so after the triumphal entry, we have Jesus meeting with some Greek uh, speaking Jews. And, um, and that, again, it's, uh, it's hard sometimes if you, as you look through these things, you're saying, why, why, why is that even mentioned in here? You know, because here he is, he just entered into Jerusalem. We all know as, as Christian believers and having read the story and heard the story many times, what's hap what's going to happen. And yet we're told about this meeting between Jesus and some Greek Jews. Like, like what, you know, it's, it's like a, a break, almost like a commercial break. <laughs> you know, there's something, di something different happening here than we expect. And, uh, and these, these Greek speaking Jews are actually not, they're not Jews. I'm sorry. They're, they're Greeks. And, uh, and they're, and they come to Jesus and they're, um, Learn, want to know about him and jesus um is if i can find that section there again it's uh i mean it's when you when you see some of these things for what they are it's it's amazing you, you're uh I think we get more fascinated by by who who these writers are that how how um, unbelievably gifted they were as authors and uh, artists really in painting a picture with these words. So um, now there were Greeks among those who had come up to worship to, at the feast. They came to Philip. Philip is a Greek name who was from Bethsaida in Galilee and asked him, sit, we would like to see Jesus. Uh, sir, we would like to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. Jesus answered them. The hour has come for the son of man to be glorified. Amen, amen, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains just a grain of wheat. But if it dies, it produces much fruit. Whoever loves his life loses it, and whoever hates his life loses it. Uh, whoever hates his life in this world will preserve it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there also will my servant be. The Father will honor who, whoever serves me. I am troubled now, yet what should I say? Father, save me from this hour? But it was for this purpose that I came to, the, to this hour. Um, Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it and will glorify it again. The crowd there heard it and said it was thunder. But others said, an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered and said, the voice did not come for my sake, but for yours. Um, now, so he, he, uh, When the, these Greeks come to meet Jesus, what happens? He uh, he's speaking to them, and it's like a, a theophany, a, a, an appearance of the voice of God is heard by not just by Jesus and his disciples, but by that whole community there. These Gentiles, these Greeks, hear the voice of God. They they don't know exactly what it said what it meant or anything but but it, it's um john again saying here um jesus is came not just for the jews but he came for everybody and that it's it's like pointing to this uh the church that will be born after the after the uh crucifixion and the resurrection of jesus and so he's he's again pointing to both Mark and Luke and John, I mean, point to their own communities in their gospels. They're they're writing for their own communities, and um, and so it's important to remember that as we read it too, that um, there was already formed a church. It was different than the one we see in many ways, but it it was that had a lot of similarities too, or some similarities. 
Um, and then, and then, and in that, Jesus is predicting his death, um, where he tells, he says that he's going to die. He knows how he's going to die, and um, and again, he doesn't. He's unlike Mark, and and even in, in all the synoptics, Jesus is tormented by his death. In in John. When Jesus predicts his death, it's like, I say this for you because I, you know, I, for me, I know I have to do it. It's my job. It's almost like I'm going to do this because my father wants me to do this. And, and I know what's going to happen. And, and I'm okay with that, so to speak, uh, because I have to do it because the father wants me to do it. And he, but he's also almost, he's in his own knowledge as God, as the son of God, he, he can say that he knows that it will not end in death. You know, so he, he's aware of that in, in John much more so than in the other gospels. Um, and then now I'm going to move all the way down to the account of the Last Supper. Now, these two accounts are very different from one another. That's, uh, yeah, Pat, no, before, up, up before that. Um, right, right here, at the Passover with the, with the disciples. And in, it's in um, Mark chapter 14, 12 to 21, and, and um, or 12 to, 12 to 25, actually. And in John, it goes from chapter 13 all the way through chapter 17. Now, they're very different accounts. In, in the three synoptic gospels, we have the institution of the mass, of the Eucharist, where Jesus says the words of the institution that we, that we say at mass every week and every day. You know, this is my body, take and eat, this is my body. Take and drink, this is my blood, the blood of the covenant. And um, and whereas in John, those words are never used. John doesn't tell us uh, much about the meal itself, except what a couple of things that happened during it. Now, first of all, in John's gospel, there's a new character that's introduced in the Last Supper, and that is the disciple whom Jesus loved. This is the first time he's mentioned in all the gospel. And he's mentioned now throughout the rest of the gospel on several occasions. Now, some people early on in, in tradition had it that the disciple whom Jesus loved was the, was, uh, the disciple John, um, James's brother. And, uh, but, um, Recent scholarship says that what that must might represent is not necessarily one particular disciple, but it might represent the community of uh, the author of John that he's writing to. And he's trying to, um, he's putting them right there in the midst of it. He's saying, here you are. And, and it's like a, it's almost like a, um, I, I, I think of it as, you know how we believe that at the Eucharist, when we, when we are saying the words of the institution, when we are um, breaking the, the bread the, and saying the Lamb of God, we are actually um, going through the death and the resurrection of Jesus in, in and through the symbolism and the sacrament of the Eucharist, that he actually dies and rises in that moment with us. And, and John and his gospel with the disciple whom Jesus loved is in a way, I think, that's why I like this idea of uh, the disciple whom Jesus loved being the community of John, that, that there they are, like we are, like we believe we are at the mass. In the, at the crucifixion, at the empty tomb, 
um, and um, in receiving the risen Jesus at uh, at mass, and um, they too were present. So, and as I said, it's it's a very different account of the uh, of the Last Supper. He never, like I said, he never says the words of the institution. We're never told that they have a Passover meal. As a matter of fact, for John, this occurs the night before Passover. So it, it wouldn't have been the Passover meal. It would have been um, a, a meal for before that feast, of course. And, uh, and so they're preparing for it. They're preparing for the Passover. And what is Jesus doing? He's preparing them for the Passover. In, in the Gospel of John, Jesus, um, as I said, he's, he is connected to the uh, Messiah in, in all sorts of ways, but he's, he's, he knows what's happening. And, he's, and he does his best to teach his disciples, but he also knows it's how futile it is. It's like he, uh, he's, he goes through so many times, he says, I'm telling you this now. But I, but I know you don't understand what I'm saying, you know, but one day, you know, after I have risen, you will understand. And he goes through that on many things. And he says, once you receive the advocate, the promise of the advocate, he, he um, tells them, again, these, these things are, are going to happen. He says, um, after he, his, his life is a life of service, and he, he foretells, and so he washes the feet of the disciples. He knows who's going to betray him. When he called, when Judas was called as a disciple, we're told Jesus knew he was going to betray him, but he still called it because he knew that was what he had to do because the father willed it. Then he gives them the new commandment to love one another as I have loved you. And, uh, and so those, that little section is kind of like equivalent to the story of the of the Last Supper with the disciples, and then I, where he and Mark come together again is where Peter's denial is foretold, and now it moves into these this long discourse where Jesus speaks to the disciples, is teaching them, just the disciples, just the uh, the twelve, and. Um, and they're, they're there with him, and he's, he's giving them um, like a last will and testament. He's saying, this is what's going to happen. And, um, but you know, this is part of this is where Jesus says, do not let your hearts be troubled. You have faith in God, have faith in me also. And he's telling them that, you know, this... Um, that these things that are about to happen are going to be very unsettling for you. And that he, but he wants them to believe that, to go through it in faith, to go through it, believing that, that he would not leave them alone, believing that their sorrow will turn to joy, believing that, um, you know, that they will find peace and then he closes it with a final prayer for his disciples. Um, where again, as, as the story of the Last Supper in the Gospel of Mark is very short and very quick. And um, he, uh, you know, like, let me just, I'll read from the, uh, from the institution of the Lord's Supper. While they were eating, he took a loaf of bread and after blessing it, he broke it and gave it to them. Oh, wait, I'm going to go start with the Passover with his disciples. So this is uh, chapter 12, verse 1. Um, I mean, I'm sorry. It's uh, chapter 14, verse 12. On the first day of leaven, unleavened bread, when the Passover lamb is sacrificed, his disciples said to him, where do you want us to go to make the preparation for you to eat the Passover? So he sent two of his disciples, saying to them, go into the city, and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him. And wherever he enters, say to the owner of the house, 
the teacher asks, where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs, furnished and ready. Make preparations for us there. So the disciples set out and went to the holy went to the city and found everything as he had told them and they prepared the passover meal when it was evening he came with the 12 and when they had taken their places and were eating jesus said truly i tell you one of you will betray me the one who is eating with me they began to be distressed and say to him one after another surely not i he said to them, it is one of the 12, one who is dipping bread into the bowl with me. For the son of man goes as it is written of him. But woe to that one by whom the son of man is betrayed. It would have been better for that one not to have been born. Um, and, and then the institution of the Lord's Supper. While they were eating, he took a loaf of bread and after blessing it, he broke it and gave it to them and said, take, this is my body. Um, then he took a cup and after giving thanks, he gave it to them and all of them drank from it. He said to them, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly, I tell you, I will never again drink of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. So couple things there that um, Jesus doesn't seem to know who it is that's going to betray him. He never says that Judas is going to betray him. In the Gospel of John, he does. And he even tells Judas to go and do what he has to do. He sends him out. Um, and then, of course, the institution of the Last Supper. These are the words that, um, that we use or a, a, a version of them are what we use at mass each and every week and day and um and so there that part of it is all uh, for mark that's you know again it's passover night it's the passover meal the night when the passover lamb is sacrificed so jesus again is connected to the passover lamb and mark that way this is the night that he will be offered up as a sacrifice, where he will be, um, I mean, a little while he'll be arrested and tried, and then he'll be, he'll be murdered the next day. And, um, but for John, he connects it even more so to the, to the Passover because it's done on Passover. Jesus dies on Passover. Um, whereas Mark, he dies the day after Passover. I mean, it's in the Passover season, but it's um, it's it's a little. Both of them are connecting it to the Passover, but John does it um, in a way that that's different than the other three writers, uh, because he's making this point. He's very very much um, talking about Jesus as the Lamb of God. And we'll we'll look more into that when we uh, when we talk about the crucifixion. But um, let's see. Next time, I think we're going to talk about the arrest and the trial of Jesus. Okay. Um, do you have any questions? I I guess if you have a question, you can unmute yourself. Okay. All right, then, uh, so next week, 6.30, we'll meet again. Hello. Yes. What? Do you, what, what the, okay, go ahead. You got to say something? Go ahead. No, I wasn't. Okay. Okay, no. Um, do you believe that John is the John, the apostle, the one who wrote? No, this gospel, you don't. We don't know who wrote John, who wrote the Gospel of John. We don't know who wrote the Gospel of Mark. They're anonymous sources, really, but they've been attributed to, um, like, to Mark and to John, 
um, because it was uh, in their communities, like the Joe and I community that, um, that developed after John, in John's lifetime while he was still alive, that Joe and I community um, is the one that in a sense put together this gospel. Whoever it was, a member of that community um, put together that gospel. So um, was John a source for that gospel? I believe, yes. Yeah. Okay. But, okay. But probably, because it wasn't put together in its final form until 100 years after the death of Jesus. So the chances of being John, the apostle, are nil. Unless he was mm -hmm. Abraham. Okay. okay. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? I just got to tell Patty something not related after this. Oh, oh okay. We'll tell her. <laughs> okay. Patty, I